Hi guys, this video is about animal cells and the ways that they are differentiated. And I'm using a little bit of a different recording technology for this, so hopefully it works. Um, but I wanted to show you a like Google Slides presentation. In addition to doing the video and everything, I will um, share a link to the presentation itself on Google Classroom. So in case um, you, I, I don't know, want to look back at that, you can. Um, otherwise, you should be doing this in uh, play pause it and we'll pause and ask questions as we go. Um, but this is all about animal cells. So I'm going to show you our slideshow. Okay, so um, this is one way I, that I wanted to show you cell differentiation. Cell differentiation occurs in basically every type of cell. Um, all the different types of bacteria that you'll see are all a little bit different from each other and they all uh, work a little differently. Um, and then plant cells, they have some differentiation as well. Obviously the cells that make up the petals are different than the cells that make up the stem, and those are different than cells that make up root systems, um, and they're different than leaves. So um, obviously there's a lot of differentiation happening even in plant cells. But I thought this would be a good opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about the types of body cells that we have, um, and all animal cells have, or all animals have these cells, excuse me. So um, go ahead and take some notes as we go. Um, there are lots and lots of types of animal cells, but we're going to focus on these kinds um, just for this presentation. So we're going to look at some red blood cells. Um, leave yourself some space to write about each of these if you're starting to copy that down. Um, we're also going to look at some white blood cells. Uh, we're going to look at muscle cells, neurons, and reproductive cells. And they're all pretty different from each other, and the function is all pretty different. So red blood cells, first of all, um, all of our blood cells are created in our bones. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that, but um, red blood cells, white blood cells, they're all created in the bone marrow. And that's sort of like a site for creating blood cells. Um, and it's interesting because even among the different types of blood cells, they have different functions and structures. So the red blood cell, as you guys probably already know, carries oxygen, and that's its job, that's its function. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but the um, you don't have to memorize these structures. You don't even have to write them down. But I do want you to get the understanding that there's a small structure with one iron in the middle, and uh, one iron atom, excuse me. Of course, there's tons of carbon and hydrogen atoms. You can even see some nitrogens in here. And then these red ones represent oxygens uh, or places where oxygen is present. Present. Uh, looks like there's one, two, three, four, five oxygens on each of those. And then within a single hemoglobin, which is a word that you probably have heard before. Or actually, I would love for you to learn that word. Um, each hemoglobin has four of those proteins, four heme proteins in it. And then the, the heme proteins are contained by uh, a very complicated folded protein on the outside that creates one hemoglobin. So four hemes in one hemoglobin. Uh, in other words, there's four irons in a single hemoglobin and multiple oxygens, like 20 oxygens. Um, but this is a protein structure. This is a uh, protein structure and they have kind of combined there. And then there are millions of these in each red blood cell. You don't need to remember the name there. Um, but in any case, um, when they come together, all these hemoglobins are contained in the blood cell and it makes this disc shape. Um, what other organelles would you expect the blood cell to need? Hopefully you said that a blood cell still needs to have a nucleus. It still needs to have um, 
pro, uh, mitochondria. Mitochondria is going to be very important. Um, it will have ribosomes. And in fact, the ribosomes are where the proteins are made for hemoglobin and the heme proteins. So, um, so when you think of the ribosomes in a blood cell, they're primarily going to be making the proteins necessary to carry oxygen. Um, it's possible that they have other proteins in them. Um, obviously, they need to have other structures and organelles to function as a cell. But, um, but primarily, it's going to be making the proteins for hemoglobin. And that's something that sets them apart from other cells. Um, let's go to the next picture, uh, white blood cells. White blood cells are another type of blood cell. They also come from the bone marrow and they're created there. Uh, the DNA replication primarily happens in the bone marrow for these cells, but they still have a nucleus. They still have mitochondria. They still have all of the parts that are necessary for a cell to be a cell and to function. Um, I love this picture because you can see front and center this white blood cell. Um, in fact, you can see in the background, there's another one right back here. But it gives you a much better picture of just how crowded the cells probably are in blood. Um, and, and a lot of photos don't really do that justice. It makes it look like there's tons of fluid and the cells are spread apart. And that's not actually true. The cells are actually really quite close and squished together and all in the same place. And you can kind of see um, sort of some red blood cells. Like this is probably a red blood cell. This is a red blood cell. Um, in fact, this disc is probably one. If this is a red blood cell, honestly, I can't really tell. But if it is, it's probably just a little bit hypertonic. Um, you can see that it doesn't look like a really good disc. Um, but in any case, uh, white blood cells have a very different function from red blood cells. What do you guys think the function of a white blood cell is? So I don't know if you guys know this, but white blood cells are part of your immune system. They are actually sort of the soldiers that destroy invaders. Um, so they're going to go out and get viruses and bacteria and um, any other invaders, fungus, that kind of thing, uh, and destroy it if there is a threat to the body. Um, other cells will tag those invaders with the antibodies, and then these guys come in and destroy it. So... Um, I'm gonna show you the next picture of a white blood cell starting that process. And look at that. There's uh, that word, phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, gosh, you guys, it looks like it, they're eating, it's eating some cheese curls or something. But, um, but in any case, this is a white blood cell and it is going through phagocytosis in order to surround the bacteria. And then, um, there are some structures inside the cell. Do you guys remember what structures are there to help process waste, like cellular waste? Hopefully you said the lysosomes. Animals have lysosomes. Plants can have lysosomes as well, but um, animal cells definitely make good use of lysosomes. Um, that would be my guess of the organelle that would be breaking down the bacteria. And then what process um, would be spitting back out the waste particles from, of the bacteria. Hopefully you said exocytosis. So in the book, there is this whole section about endocytosis. Phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis. And then um, when it spits it back out, that would be exocytosis. Uh, and there are other cells in our body, uh, our, kidney our liver cells and our kidney cells are specialized in order to process um, all the waste particles, like broken down bits of bacteria, broken down whatever, and to um, excrete that from the body. So um, it's a very complex system, obviously. And um, trying to think if I want to get too far into phagocytosis, let's just talk for a moment about that. Um, phagocytosis is actually the process that a lot of scientists assume was used for the first cells to get mitochondria. So there is this idea, there is this idea that mitochondria existed as its own structure, uh, kind of like a prokaryote. Um, the mitochondria would exist on its own and it would be doing cellular respiration. Um, there is some evidence that it could exist by itself. And so 
Um, the thought is that the earliest cells did phagocytosis and ate the mitochondria. And then the benefit of having the mitochondria was that it would provide uh, energy for the cell um, through cellular respiration. And so it just kept the mitochondria rather than sending the lysosomes to break it down and spit it back out. The idea is that it kept the mitochondria. And the evidence for that is that mitochondria has its own set of DNA that is different from the rest of the cell. And typically the mitochondria matches, the DNA from the mitochondria matches the DNA for the mother's mitochondria and, um, and not the dad. So mitochondria DNA is passed down from mother to child. Um, sorry, if you're a guy, you're not going to pass down any mitochondria. So <laughs> uh, if you have kids of your own, your wife will be the one that, um, that passes down the mitochondria DNA. So, um, any case that is another, um, sort of thought behind cells that you may not know. Um, let's look at muscle cells. Muscle cells are kind of interesting. There's three different kinds, and I'm not going to get too far into the three different kinds. You don't need to memorize them. Um, but they are differentiated even among the muscles. So you have some cardiac muscle, which honestly, in my opinion, is kind of somewhere in the middle between the other two. It looks a little bit like skeletal muscle in the fact that the muscle strands are really long. The muscle cells are really long. Um, skeletal muscle cells are very, very long, and they are very much like a tube uh, or a long cylinder. And then smooth muscle, this would be the type of muscle that lines your stomach, your esophagus, your intestines. That's the kind of muscle that is uh, involuntary and, uh, and you can't move it through like thinking move, you know. <laughs> skeletal muscle, we can control the movement. We can think, you know, move your arm and your arm moves. But smooth muscle is involuntary. So, um, so even the structure of the cells is a little different. And it has to do with the fact that it's involuntary. The heart muscle, likewise, is also a little bit, uh, it's considered involuntary, although you can sort of, you know, calm your heart rate by, by calming yourself down. But um, the cardiac muscle is considered involuntary. It obviously contracts and causes your heart to beat regularly. Thank goodness, right? And then uh, skeletal muscle would be just anything used for motor movement, um, walking, throwing, picking something up, grasping it. Um, all of those motions are, rely on skeletal muscle. Something kind of interesting about these cells is, for example, this cell right here has one, two, three nuclei. And that's what those are, they're nuclei. How many nuclei are involved in smooth muscle cells? Just one, just one. So one nuclei per cell for the smooth muscle. And obviously the cardiac muscle is a little bit more involved and it's kind of not so clear where one, one cell stops and another cell begins. So a little different. Um, but you may not have known that muscle cells are extremely long. So this is kind of like if you chopped the cells this way and chopped them on this end. But I'm going to show you kind of the bigger picture here. So... In our bodies, we have um, tendons that connect muscles to bone, right? And the tendons are kind of made of like cell uh, cell membranes, basically. It's like the, um, the connective tissue um, that exists in the plasma membrane, basically. It's not exactly just a plasma membrane, but the point is that they continue all along this, like a single muscle cell. So there's a fiber, a fibrous attachment here, and then the cell would continue with from that attachment um, the length of the muscle. And so in each muscle, there are muscle bundles or groups of, of well, not I guess it's not that simple, but so there's a muscle bundle. And then in each muscle bundle, um, you can see here, this is a single fascicle. Um, so this is, if, if we were to blow that picture up, this is a one fascicle here. And then each fascicle has a muscle, a bunch of muscle fibers. And this is just one right here. And it's blown up for you here. A muscle fiber is also known as a muscle cell. And so a single muscle cell extends 
um, through the fascicle, through the bundle, it extends from, from one end of the tendon to the other end of the tendon uh, where it connects to bone. Um, they're extremely long. They have lots and lots of nuclei and obviously they have lots and lots of mitochondria. Um, why would cellular respiration be super, super important for a muscle fiber or a muscle cell? Well, muscle cells do lots and lots of work, right? All, all the cells in your body are doing types of work, but muscle, muscles do motor movement. That requires an enormous amount of energy, just moving. I mean, this is why plants don't move very much because it requires so much energy to actually do motor movement. The fact that we walk around, I mean, we have to eat a lot to make up for that. Um, we need lots and lots of energy. The process of... Um, cellular respiration is super important in muscles uh, for that reason. And it, I don't know if you guys have heard of this. I want you to write this down. Um, there's a difference between anaerobic and aerobic um, cellular respiration. In fact, let me just add that to the slide. I'm going to just do that right now before I forget. Um, there's aerobic respiration and anaerobic. Kind of spell that out for us. And aerobic. Okay. Um, I'll present that again so you can see it a little bit bigger. Okay. Hopefully you can see it bigger. And aerobic respiration involves um, just typical cellular respiration where you are taking in oxygen and sugars and you're using them uh, to, and they go through like a combustion reaction and basically spits out uh, carbon dioxide and, um, and energy and water. Um, anaerobic respiration is the kind of respiration that comes into play as soon as uh, oxygen basically runs out. And um, so this is like if you were running a marathon <laughs> or just running for a long time and uh, Basically what happens is eventually you won't be able to um, get oxygen by breathing like fast enough for aerobic exercise to happen, aerobic um, respiration. So anaerobic respiration will kick in and um, it basically is a, it's a different process, but it still produces energy. It's the process where you can um, like burn like fat cells, I guess you could say, like fat cells kind of become usable sugar cell, uh, not cells, I'm sorry, fat cell, okay, how do I say this? Fats and lipids in your body become sugars. They're like turned into sugars and then they're used for respiration. Um, but in any case, what happens in anaerobic respiration is it creates this byproduct, byproduct that um, causes like pain <laughs> in your muscles. So if you exercise really hard and you're not used to exercising like that, um, you will get extremely sore, painful muscles the next day. And that is because of this, um, this chemical that's produced. In fact, if you exercise a little too long and you're not used to it, you'll start to feel pain like right then, right away. <laughs> um, feels like your lungs are burning and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely... Um, something to be said for training your body to do that. Uh, and you don't want to throw it into anaerobic respiration without a lot of training and working your way up. Um, just as, as a side note, uh, even inside the muscle fibers, there are these smaller structures. If you zoom in, you can see actin and myosin inside a myofibril. Um, and these are the structures that actually cause contraction. Um, these are very specialized proteins. Um, the actin is a protein um, that the myosin can, can kind of bind to and grab onto and pull it in closer. And when it pulls it in closer, that's when your muscle contracts. So um, these cells are going to be relying on those types of proteins being produced by the ribosomes and everything. So, um, so yeah, uh, and they do, they do some cellular replicate, I mean, DNA gets replicated and cells can be multiplied. Um, and that's part of the way that you can build muscle. So um, moving on. 
neurons, guys, neurons are so cool. Neurons make all of this possible that connects our entire body and all of our systems. And you don't need to know every, every detail of this type of cell. Um, it would be good if you know that the uh, electrical impulses that we use for controlling muscle movement, that comes from a dendrite of one neuron and it travels to the axon. So you can see there's this sort of directional arrow here for us. Um, so it starts the dendrite, goes down the axon, ends at the axon terminal. And then on this end, there would be another neuron with dendrites, maybe multiple neurons surrounding this axon terminal. Oh, by the way, the word terminal uh, reminds me a little bit of like an airplane terminal. It's like where it's your last stop before you get on the airplane. So um, any case, there are little chemicals um, that get sent, like little molecules that get sent um, from one axon terminal to a dendrite of another neuron. And depending upon what chemical gets released and what chemical gets received, um, those that can communicate different things. So you can get a communication for pain. You can get a communication that says to move your muscle. You can, you can actually, I guess you're, you'd be sending that communication. Um, you could be getting a communication that it, that tells you something is hot or cold. Um, but in any case, each of those has a different chemical that gets sent between neurons. And um, the message from the dendrites gets sent um, by these, these little structures that kind of hops over each one. Uh, and it's like a shortcut. Um, think of like a little highway. It goes faster um, if, the, if the electrons travel quickly across these uh, myelin sheaths. Again, you don't have to remember the term myelin sheath. I'm not going to even ask that you remember this term soma. I think it would be good for you to learn these three, though. The dendrite and the impulse traveling down the axon to the axon terminals. Um, as you can see, this is a highly specialized cell. It also has a nucleus. Every cell has a nucleus. And even though the nucleus contains all the genetic information for your body, it contains all of the chromosomes that you, that you need. Like someone could take a neuron or someone could take a red blood cell. They could get all of your DNA information. It's still not going to necessarily produce all the same proteins. So definitely in a neuron, there is a focus on the proteins needed for the myelin sheath, for example, and the creation of a myelin sheath. I will say that neurons uh, don't really typically go through um, mitosis. Uh, typically, once your neurons are created and you've developed all of them through your childhood, they're, they're basically set. And so that is one of the reasons that when you get nerve damage, it's such a serious issue. Uh, or if you get a terrible back injury that, that messes up your nervous system, it's a big issue because you can't just grow new neurons. You can't do it. Um, some, some scientists have done this using stem cells and stem cells are basically undifferentiated cells that are going to become other cells and they can differentiate into a neuron or they can differentiate into a red blood cell or they can differentiate into a muscle cell. And it all depends on what the body needs and, um, how they're directed to, to, um, develop that happens when you're very young. So, uh, any case, neurons are highly specialized. They do just their, um, their one very, very important function. And obviously the shape of them is pretty unique as well. Okay, last but not least, we're gonna just um, touch on reproductive cells. We've talked about these off and on throughout the year, but um, obviously I think most of us recognize a sperm cell. Um, and then this much larger structure is the egg cell. Um, this is a single cell. They're both single cells. It's kind of amazing to see the size difference. This at least gives you an idea of how much bigger an egg cell is than a sperm cell. And then um, the sperm cell is probably much closer in size to like a bacteria. Um, it's quite a bit smaller than a lot of body cells. And um, 
guys, why would it have this sort of flagella structure right here? Why would it need this big long tail? Hopefully you said it needs a big long tail in order to travel um, from the uh, like the vagina to the uterus um, into the fallopian tubes if needed um, and to meet up with an egg. Uh, and I don't know if you know all those structures in a woman's body. We haven't had a chance this year to talk a lot about human anatomy, but um, the sperm cell has to travel really far. And um, sperm cells that are not as well developed, just don't make it. <laughs> so um, there can be a lot of reproductive issues there, especially as we get older, we don't always produce as, um, our reproductive cells are not in as good of shape, I guess you could say. Um, likewise, uh, egg cells are, well, they're a little different. Um, men will keep producing sperm cells their entire lives, while women are born with the total number of egg cells that they will ever have. So um, definitely over time, the egg cells can experience some breakdown and some, um, I guess, aging, you, you could say. And that's why it's so common if a woman has a baby at an older age that they could have issues um, with the baby uh, because of the issues with meiosis and mitosis. Um, you know, you could end up with extra chromosomes, um, like with Down syndrome, um, you could end up, you're more likely to end up with an egg cell that has, you know, extra chromosomes. Uh, you're more likely to have issues in cell division and development earlier on in the pregnancy. Um, in any case, this is an egg cell. <laughs> um, and each one carries half a set of DNA. Of course, when they combine, they become a zygote. Uh, and that is also a single cell. A zygote is a single cell. And once it starts the process of mitosis, it can be, it can multiply its cells and it becomes an embryo and then that becomes a fetus and then that becomes a, you know, then once they're born, then you have a baby. So um, there's a lot to be said for that human development or even animals go through the same thing, animal development. Um, and it all starts with these two cells. And each of these cells are super different from other cells. Um, the sperm cell has to enter the egg cell in order to become a zygote uh, and in order for the chromosomes to uh, like find their homologous pairs and start the process of DNA, uh, DNA replication and then mitosis. Um, but this whole process of the sperm entering the egg, is that a little bit more like exocytosis or endocytosis? I hope that you said endocytosis. Endo means into or inside. So uh, that is more like the process of endocytosis. Kind of reminds me of uh, phagocytosis, um, but it's not like the egg eats the sperm. It's not exactly that way. Uh, the sperm actually has quite a job to do to get in there. And the moment one sperm gets in there, typically the egg um, makes its cell wall, uh, cell, I'm sorry, its cell membrane becomes impermeable at that point uh, so that no other sperm can enter. So not exactly like phagocytosis at all, but it would be a little bit more like endocytosis. So that is the last uh, cell that I wanted to give you guys a look at, um, but I hope that you're getting the picture that basically all body cells um, are differentiated for specific functions. They produce different proteins, um, for different functions and um, a lot of them, some of them don't go through mitosis or replicating the cell. Um, and some of them wear down over time. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that you got a good picture of that. Thanks for watching.